Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a misty dawn here in the northeast corner of South Africa, the magnificent Kruger National Park, where light has just emerged, emerged from the dark. The sun is about to come up over that horizon. You can see there's some mist there, and you're on a live morning drive with me, James Hendry, and Brian Joubert, the thumb, on camera. Good morning, Brian. How are you today? Oh, great, thank you, Excellent, good stuff. I hope you're all well wherever you happen to be in the world and whatever time of day you find it. I think some of you are probably on almost tomorrow uh, if you're in the far eastern hemisphere. In the far west, of course, you're probably still on yesterday. In the final control today, we have Louise Pavin in my ear and Kirsten McLennan-Smith, I think, is on the keys. And on the other vehicle, Samwise Gamgee being filmed by the inimitable Viam Durenbrak. I'm not sure where they are at the moment. I think they're heading off to the far east of this reserve uh, to see if they can find the Birmingham boys. Lots of things sort of planned for the day. Of course, as we know out here, plans go awry as often as you make them. And we tend to plan on the hoof as we go along. Now, you are live, as I said to you, so please do talk to us throughout the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter, or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email. I've come out to the sort of western side of Juma just to see if we can't pick up on tracks of Karula the Queen and her two little babies, who gave us possibly one of the most wonderful sightings I've ever had in the wild yesterday. We had those two little cubs, now almost three months old, playing. Hmm maybe about 10 feet from the vehicle. It was a wonderful, wonderful privilege. And so that's our plan. We stopped here. We've been sitting here now for about three minutes, just having a listen as the dawn chorus starts to fire up. It is quite quiet, and that's pretty normal until the sun comes up, and that will probably be in about 10 or 15 minutes. Remember, we will be changing the times for the safaris, as far as I remember, at about on the 1st of May, I think, sorry. And that 1st of May change, of course, will coincide with the changing of the day length over here. Uh, we had one update from the evening. Lucy in South Bend, Indiana, thank you for that. You heard lions roaring quite far, you say, from the Juma camera at some time, about 3.30 this morning. Remember, the lions, of course, those four Birmingham males, lost their cohort sometime yesterday. He died. So there are now only four Birmingham males left, not five. It was, I think, Scrapper, the one who used to spend quite a lot of his time alone. He had those sort of blackish eyes and he had so many scars all over his face. He succumbed to something. We don't know what it was. I'm hoping that the Sabi Sands will do an autopsy. And a number of you are asking whether we'll let you know. We will certainly let you know if they let us know. Uh, we certainly haven't heard about any of the, uh, anything untoward about the two lionesses they've taken away and done various tests on. Right, without further ado, let us move into this slightly chilly morning. It's certainly not cold, about 16 degrees centigrade or 61 degrees Fahrenheit, but I have my woolly hat on just in case there's a little bit of a nip in the air. We don't want to get too chilly out here and we'll be watching the ground quite carefully for signs of female leopard and very small leopards with her. I was surprised yesterday at the size of those two little cubs. Uh, one of them, well, they're probably both about that big, so they're tiny still. They're almost three months old. One definitely a male, not sure about the other one, quite possibly a female because it is smaller. There's a definite size difference. You know what, I just had an instinct today to tick check down this old hyena den road and see if there's something there. <laughs> Nate, while we drive down here into the rising dawn, you're interested in how somebody becomes a safari person. Well, Nate, a safari person, you mean, I'm assuming you mean a guide. Nate, there are a number of courses you can do to become a guide in this particular area. Um, some of them are fairly questionable quality, but others are very good. But basically, once you've got the basic qualifications, which are not very difficult to get at all, uh, it is time on the ground, time and experience with animals, driving vehicles, getting used to areas, tracking things, learning about the different trees and plants and animals and birds, and that can take time. So that's just time on the ground. So if you wanted to become a safari guide, 
I would suggest you come out here, do one of the courses that would take you probably, you know, sort of six month courses, a good, good length time to do a course. And you seek a job at one of these lodges and you start, you do a little bit of lodge training there and then you start off as a guide. But remember, I, I mean, it certainly took me at least a year of actual guiding before I felt confident and competent at proper guiding. And that's just because it takes time. In the seat, some take a little bit less time than that, some take a bit more. And the confidence only comes with time. Your experience of animal behavior, for example, you can read everything you like about how um, elephants behave and, and how they, the different signs that they will give you. But until you actually experience it, until you actually learn to read the body language and behavior of the animals out here, it is very difficult to interpret what's going on. So it is time on the ground. Watch your head there. And Linda, you are interested in the lions that died. You say, which two lionesses that died? No one's died recently, don't worry. It's just those two that the Birmingham's killed. Uh, they were eventually removed by the Sabi Sands and they go and do various tests on them just to see if they, I mean, we know they died of natural causes in so much as the Birmingham boys were natural causes, but, and I'm sure they took the third lioness that died as well, I just wasn't here. And they will do tests on bovine tuberculosis and try and find out if there's any kind of illness or anything they need to know about. So they will send, seldom leave a lion carcass out here to just kind of um, rot, because they're great for doing research on once they die. I have Samwise Gamgee talking to me on the radio. Go ahead. Sam is operating at Cape Town speed today. Go ahead, go ahead, Sam. No, no luck. Right, now the reason we came down here, it was an old hyena den, but I do know that Karula came, I think she sort of came into this area yesterday evening. And I know an old hyena den would be quite a good place to stash her cubs. A little a termite mound like this covered in vegetation with the old burrow in it, in which those little ones can take refuge. Brian, I found you some breakfast, if you can believe it. Sam, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I don't think his radio is turned on. Look, everybody, I found us breakfast. I'm so kind. Unfortunately, this breakfast is not ripe. These, everybody, are jackalberries. Oh, quickly, Sam's got a leopard. Good morning, everyone. We have just spotted a leopard. There he is. We came across him as we are driving up Buffalo's cut line. I'm going to see if I can get another good shot of that leopard. We crossed over our boundary, so we can't drive. get lucky and see him come back onto the road. Well done for him. That was awesome. We just managed to get a good shot, quick shot of that leopard. You are with Sam Chevalier and Viam on the vehicle this morning. We're very, very excited. We were planning on going to see if we could find the Birmingham males and we've just bumped a leopard, so that was exciting. He was just walking on the road in front of us and then he dipped into the thicket. So, so he could very well come back out there. How, how exciting, I haven't heard that, where you just come across the tracks. And we just followed the tracks and came across that beautiful leopard. Once again, this is a live safari. So we are here in the Sabi Sand, 60,000 hectare property. And we are traversing on Juma, and we may also traverse on Cheetah Plains and Arethusa. And we are hoping 
to get some great questions from you, particularly around maybe the Birmingham boys. We want to talk a little bit more about that. We apparently have lost one of the, the males from the Birmingham. Um, so we're not sure what the story is and how it died and all that sort of thing. So we'd love to get any questions around that. And we saw leopard cubs yesterday, which was highly exciting. But we're just going to continue. Again. Vian, do you reckon he's gone into the, the deep? I believe it's the yeah. What's his name? I believe it's Kojima. 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 James Henry, do you copy James? I'm not sure if my comms are working. I'm trying to get... How exciting was that? Just what happens, we get that is dominant in this area. I still haven't had the pleasure of really getting to know him a bit better, but we at least had a glimpse. So they've moved, mo he has moved. Okay, I need to get hold of James. Something's wrong with my comms. I'm just going to try and figure it out. Open comms. James, do you copy? Okay. I put my open comms on now and I can hear you. We just located, um, I think it's Mvula, is that right? Majiba. Um, he, he was walking on Buffelsuk Main, about 100 meters down the road from Mvubu, and he's just moved into the block, into Buffelshook. East or west of which road? Uh, which road? 100 meters east of uh, Buffelshook, down Gar uh, Buffelshook Cutline. So I'm afraid that doesn't make sense. 100 meters east of which junction on Buffelshook? The junction of Mvubu and Buffalo's Catlan. Did you get that all? Right. Uh, the, the leopard has moved. With that, let's just quickly go and see what Kim's. Well, that's a very good start, isn't it? That seems to be Gajima, young male leopard. Ooh, that is... Sorry, I'm just... I'm going to have to get Brian to super zoom or something sitting on the tree over there. And just to tell you that I have had a conversation with Aubrey, and Orbs says that... Uh, gave me an indication of where they left Karula yesterday with her little babies. And so we're going to go and have a look around there. It looks to be, that is a very unusual, it, I mean, initially it's got the shape of a Wahlberg's eagle, which it can't be because they've all left and it's also twice the size. I think it's a Marshall. You can see the kind of ruffled, scruffy head. I think it's a big Marshall eagle, everybody. That is a huge, huge bird. And you can see sitting next to it, a fork-tailed drongo who's very disconcerted by the presence of that big raptor, but he's much too fast for the little for the big raptor to catch. So he'll just sit there and shout at him and tell him to go away. <laughs> Huge bird. All right, let's leave the Marshall Eagle, everybody. I think I want to pop down the court, down the way here and just see if we can't pick up on anything of Kurula, our queen. And because she ate yesterday and she ate well, uh, it's quite possible that she will stay with the youngsters and just spend a bit of time with them around where she left them. She left them in the block just down here, uh, around where we saw her a little while back with a kill on a beautiful tree, the kind of fairy tale tree I call them. 
the Lofold Mugberry in here. Um, if we do find the little ones in there on their own, uh, then we will leave. We will only be with the little ones if the mother is with them. So just be aware of that. But we'll go and have a look-see at the last position where they were left. Just change gear. So there is a little bit of a nip in the air. Very autumnal morning, this. in Washington, I'm not sure. Weedy, hello, hello Weedy in Washington. Weedy from Washington, you're interested in the dynamics of the Birmingham boys and what will change now that one of them has met an untimely demise at the hands of what we don't know. Weedy, a, the, the dynamics of the Birmingham boys, I don't think are gonna change that much at all. That male that has died was on his own a lot. He spent most of his time alone. It was normally the four and then the one. So I don't think that he's going to be, uh, affect the dynamics greatly. Uh, wh I suppose what could happen is that the northern boundaries of the territory might be patrolled slightly less and maybe there'll be a little bit less sort of patrolling around the boundaries because they, don't, they haven't split into two groups. But no, I think largely things will remain pretty much the same. So it's, quite, it's possible that their territory might shrink slightly, but the four of them are certainly enough to defend it. But because they are, if those four stay together and they don't split into two and two, the territory will inevitably contract slightly because they won't have two groups patrolling the boundaries every time. So the Salatis might incur slightly from the south, from the north. The Matimbas might come a little bit further from the south. The Majingalan a little bit from the west. So those are the four sort of coalitions around here that might affect the Birmingham boys. But otherwise, I, you, know, they've got, you know, they've got pretty used to being in charge here. And I think things will carry on. I don't, look, we have heard, of course, of these skybed males, these great legends of uh, coalition of nine male lions coming south out of the Manialeti. We have yet to see them here, of course. And, uh, I mean, a coalition of nine males is never going to survive. I mean, it's not going to survive as a coalition. But we're getting into the area now. So let's drive carefully and watch the road. Sorry, Chris Rogue, I'm afraid I missed your question. The, the game drive radio was going. Can you give it to me again, please, Louise? Oh, Chris Rogue, a nice question. If we got Said, we found Karula and the Cubs, and she was there on her own, and she then left during the, while we were in the sighting, would we then leave with her? And has that happened before? And um, the answer is yes, we would definitely leave. And has she done it before? I mean, I don't know if she has. She hasn't done it while I've been here. I've only had one sighting with her and the cubs. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if she has. I think it's likely that she would. You know, she doesn't see us as a threat. And so I don't think she would mind leaving her cubs if we were there. But the problem is, of course, A, we will make the cubs nervous with the engines. I certainly noticed that yesterday. And at the same time, because you, if you start the engine, they're, they're not familiar with our voices, you might find that they start listening to our voices rather than to what they should be listening to, of course, which is for danger that might come. Now, there's a very large low-felt milkberry, Manalcara mochisa, just inside the block here. And we watched her on that tree with a kill some time back she had an impala in there and she ate it for about three or four days so we're going to just drive in there and have a quick look that's where Aubrey said they left her of course there's always the option to try and walk in but 
The only issue with that is giving the cubs a fright. And so it's better if we know where her last position was to just go and have a quick look in the vehicle first rather than give them a fright on foot. And it is amazing how much more afraid animals are on foot than they are in the vehicles. I'm just going to make sure that I find the correct tree here. It's just inside here somewhere. I think the sun is about to come up, Ryan. It's going to warm our faces. Oh, there it is. Let's just stop and have a quick appreciation as soon as we can get into a position. There we go, everyone. You can just see it peeping up there. And I feel that if one can, one should always take the time to just inhale a bit of the sunrise. Mm. Mm, the birds are coming to life with the sun. Tail drone goes quack, quack, quack. Chin spot batters. <whistles> the doves, obviously. The ring necked dove. very pretty indeed and I hope that many of you who have not been out here will be able to one day come out here and feel this incredible sense of the sunrise and Aaron all the way from New Zealand you're asking about the white-faced whistling duck and whether it stays with one mate for light. I'm life. I don't actually know, Aaron. As we watch the sun there, I'll have a quick look for you. A white-faced whistling duck. I'm not sure what its arrangement is socially. They live in big flocks. I don't think they have a monogamous arrangement, but I will check for you quickly. Monogamous, yes. Nest well hidden in waterside grasses and edges. There we go. That is a stunning picture that looks like an impressionist painted it. No, not an impressionist at all. That just has shown my horrible ignorance of art history. Okay, let's carry on. We're not too far from where I think Perutsky has left her babies. The tree in question is just in here, so we're going to drive very, very slowly and carefully in here. And Kyle, a very valid question as we try and ease our way in here. Kyle, you want to know how far away she is from or how far she has left them from the hyena den. Long way, Kyle. We're pretty much the southern boundary of Juma, well, just about the southern boundary, and she left those at least the hyena den is pretty much on the northern boundary so probably a good three kilometers as the crow flies 1.8 miles oh they love it up quickly to sam we have just found the leopard again we looked we went back to see if we could find last tracks this could very well be kojima the one leopard that we only see about two to three minutes of every single time we see him. He's a young male, is what VM's telling me, and he's about to go back into the thicket where he's sent marking over there. Drive vehicle quickly. Comms. Aubrey, do you copy Aubrey? Just located that young male again. I think it's Kojima. 
it's yeah, carry on down Bifusuk. Go ahead, Johan. Johan, we're probably about 100 meters to the east on Buffalo Cut Line. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Johan, I was just following that leopard. Um, 100 meters from the junction of Mvubu and Bufuso cut line. Animals moving in. Right, sorry about that, uh, fairly he heavy link there. Sam is still with the leopard. Unfortunately, they have lost signal. Now, we have come to the milkberry tree in question and there are birds going ballistic here. So we're just going to stop and listen. This is the tree around which he left those cubs yesterday. So we're going to drive very slowly around the termite mound and see if we can see anything. And I can hear lots of birds alarm calling. Lots of white crested helmet shrikes and forktail drongos. And I wonder if there isn't a cub in this tree. It, all right, Sam is back with the leopard. So we're still here with the leopard, and this is going to be a record breaking time if we manage to spend some more than two more minutes with this young male which we think it is is called called kinchima he's slowly he heading in an easterly direction down this road you can see that he's scent marking often well we've just seen him scent mark he's most likely going to go back in and do another scent mark there we go i'm going to stay in this position because we've actually got some terrible terrible signal here so if I sit in this position, we'll have the best opportunity to view the leopard. But it looks like it could have headed off the road there. Okay, we came here, everybody. I will tell you that we did. We sat for a little while while you went back to Sam. I did see a cub running through the, just sort of easing its way through the bush over there. I can't see the mother. I'm going to have one more look around the other side of the mound here to see if Karula is around. If she's not, we're going to pull out. Okay, so we did just have one quick view of the little white tail tip. It's exactly what the birds were alarming at, but I don't want to put pressure on them if mum isn't here. And it was slightly as I suspected, obviously as we came in. Okay, let's go back to the other leopard. Kojima is, what seems to be Kojima has just moved into the block, into Buffalsook. This is not our traversing right? But you can just see him through the thicket there. He's just come back into picture. See him now. We can't see him at the moment. He's a very, very, very shy leopard. What's him for? Yes. What a morning, though, hey? <laughs> I've been terrible. I haven't. I've been so bad on the radio because I've just got so excited to see the leopard. So at least we've managed to get some stations here. But you'll see that the vehicle that has just driven past us has been is able to go. 
into the block and follow up on that leopard. We can't because it's not our traversing right. But if I maybe get to a position there, we might be able to look into the block and see if we can watch her from a distance, him from a distance. But I've got a feeling that that, that leopard is going to come back onto the road because that's been the direction that he's been moving in. James is on the on the track for Karula while we are sticking with this very very shy leopard. It's, it's great to be with a leopard that is like this though, because you you just get to know it. You can see that it's quite shy. So there they're heading. They're gonna head over there. So I'm gonna get to the top of this corpy so we can then look down to maybe see if he comes back out onto the road. But he is highly mobile. we can do now is be patient to see if a leopard will come back through this thicket and show his beautiful face. We've only seen the back side of the leopard. Hopefully we can see the front side. Can't see him. We should we should also be able to hear some alarm calls from the various birds and possibly squirrels that might be here. So just have a look while we're looking as well. See if you can see any movements. If you do see any movement, please hashtag Safari Live. Let us know if you saw something. Because you are with us on the vehicle as well. Robin in Maryland thinks that it could very well be Mvula, not Kachima, because Kachima is way too unrelaxed for the vehicles. And you could very well be right. I mean, that's why we, we initially thought it was Kachima earlier, purely because we saw the leopard and then it went straight into the thicket. But the leopard has been coming back onto the road. So we might just see Mvula if it is Mvula again. But the best way we'll be able to tell if it is either Kachima or Mvula is by seeing the spot patterns. So hopefully, if it is Mvula, probably show its face if it is Mvula. But I'm gonna look down into this into the valley while VM looks into there because he might be just walking through the thicket and back out onto the road. But there is another vehicle that has a tracking team on it, so they'll be able to see what direction that leopard will go in. Aubrey, do you copy Aubrey? from what I'm hearing is that it's just about 50 to 70 meters in a northerly direction into the, in the thick grass and it's moving slowly in an easterly direction so if we are patient we'll be able to see this leopard and see if we can find out if it is Mvula or Kachima but how exciting is this you wake up have a cup of coffee in the morning here get in your vehicle and the next thing you following a leopard trying to pay attention to any sounds, but look at that sunrise 
has been such a... Oh, look at that. That's incredible. Nice shot there, Vim. Beautiful shot, Vim. That is the wonderful morning here on Safari Live. And you can see that those clouds are still quite prominent in the sky. I definitely woke up with a much bigger chill than yesterday. I was nice and warm in my blankets, and then I got out and I was freezing. While we sit here, just seeing if we can find this leopard, let's go and see how James is doing with tracking Karula. So, as I said to you, everybody, we saw, we got a glimpse of the baby, one of them, and not the mother. Um, it's quite thick in there. We've come out of the block now, and I just don't want to put too much pressure on anything going on there. So, I'm afraid in the absence of an obvious Karula position, we're going to leave the area. I'm sure you all understand. We want those cubs to have the best possible chance. But they're in there, they seem to be safe, and that's great news. Now, we spoke briefly about the hyena den a bit earlier, about how far away that is. And I think our next port of call will be to go towards the hyena den. We will come and check here again, I think, this afternoon, if not later at the end of this drive, just to see if she hasn't come back, maybe to feed them. She might be in there, you know, but I just don't want to drive around and look, given the thickness of the bush. So we're just going to leave it. If that's okay. There is one bird alarm calling there, Brian. You see the drongo there. Just while we look at that drongo, which is alarm calling, there's also a puffback shrike alarm calling just above it. So let's just look into the base of that bush there and see maybe if there isn't Karula there. Um, Jess, you want to know how long it's going to take for those little ones to become habituated to vehicles. Uh, Jess, I think you'll find that at about four or five months they will be completely comfortable with us, maybe even before. But at the moment they certainly aren't. And I think that's because they're just so very small still. I think the young male will become habituated more often, that, or at least more, more quickly. That's not because he's a male, it just seems to be that he's a little bit more brave than his sister at the moment and that I don't think has anything to do with their gender. I think it's got a lot to do with the individual personalities that these leopards seem to develop almost at birth. In the same way that human beings, even with twins, have different personalities when they're born. So they're just going to sit here and listen. You can hear the birds, that drongo calling there. So the birds completely gave away where that little one was with their alarm calls. <laughs> All right, let's carry on. We'll just ease a little bit further down the road here, have another one more look and then we'll press on. Now, Dara, your question is a very valid one because we are close by to where Shadow has last left her cubs. They haven't been seen for a while, which is slightly worrying, I must tell you. Um, you want to know what would happen if they all met up? Would there be a sort of familial reunion? Would the cubs approach each other? Would they run away? At this age, I don't really know. Um, I think they'd probably be quite wary because they, they're instinctually wary of everything they don't know. Um, Shadow and Karula would probably not be particularly friendly to each other when they do meet these days. Yes, they don't fight with each other, but there is a bit of hissing and it's not particularly sort of friendly. I think, you know, I think it's unlikely. I think for them to meet each other, they'd have to really kind of by chance step into each other. They wouldn't actively seek each other out and... 
Yeah, I, I don't think there would be any contact. I think that probably the mothers would hiss at each other and then maybe they'd move off. That said, there is that wonderful example at Londolozi where a grandmother actually adopted, she grandmother lost her, let's pretend it was Karula, lost her cubs, uh, met up with the, her daughter who had just had cubs. The grandmother was still lactating and she basically kidnapped one of the cubs and raised it as her own. Absolutely astounding thing which you will never read about in textbooks. So for me to say definitely what would happen, um, I wouldn't be silly enough to do that. But I think the chances are they will just try and avoid each other. Okay, I can't hear any more alarm calling going on in here. I don't want to drive back in there now. Uh, we might try a little bit later and see if she hasn't returned. Otherwise, why don't we pop over to the hyena den and see what's going on there. Brent was lucky enough to go on to Simbambili the other day. And in Simbambili, they have a hyena clan with over 50 hyenas in it. Um, Siberia, I think your question is uh, it's got something to do with do, do all the animals take an equal amount of time species-wise or do individuals take different times? And I think habituation does depend on the nature of the animal. Uh, I think certainly Gonuma and Quarantine are two great examples. Two different leopards from the same mother, same father, we think. And... Sorry, one sec. These look like little leopard cub tracks, but I think they might be civets. <laughs> from last night sometime. I don't see any adult leopard and it's highly unlikely that the little ones would be running along the road without their mum. No, they're still, their vehicle's on top of them. Okay, um, so Siberia, you know, quarantine was totally chilled. He's absolutely fine around vehicles. Kanuma, not so much. He gets a little upset around cars. He does growl, he does take the odd step towards you, growling quite viciously. And just looking on top of the termite mound there. And so, yeah, it does depend largely on the animal's personality. And it also depends on the species. Some animals will never have a to vehicles. The impala, around, the buffalo, for example, some of the buffalo bulls here, still, after they see us every single day. We come past them, they get up, they go, and they run off into the bush. They have no poor, they have no bad experience of human beings at all, or of the vehicles. So they're just naturally cautious, I think, all the time. Anyway, what a lovely start to the morning. Now, we very seldom get to show you this at this kind of detail. It's going to back up a little bit. We're looking at this dove. And we hear them calling all the time. But we very seldom get to see them in this kind of detail. Look at that. All around, I don't know why there are so many doves here, but they do very well. And they, of course, provide the bulk of the dawn chorus's lovely song every morning. the ring-necked dove. Now, the humble, humble dove like that flies at the most amazing speed. And so while they're the sort of impala of the bird world, given their abundance and commonality, they do move at an incredible speed. That's one of the ways that they avoid being nailed by all the avian predators out here. And one of the main things in many areas that hunts a dove is a falcon. A 
and we all know that falcons dive at an astonishing speed. The peregrine falcon can dive at about 200 kilometers per hour. That's 122.5, if I'm not mistaken, miles per hour. And yet still, those doves managed to get away from the falcons as they dive down. A dove can take off at an incredible speed, and it has a, it has a straight line speed. Probably, I'm sure I've clocked one doing about 70 or 80 kilometers an hour in a straight line, which is an astonishing speed. 50 miles an hour. Now we'll go and see what else we can find. <laughs> Lily, we were talking about bird calls and I of course come from the city and you want to know if the birds call in the city. They do. And it's one of the only ways that people stay in touch with the wild is the sound of the birds and the trees in their garden. And I remember certainly when I used to live in Johannesburg, the best sound that I could ever hear on a cold Johannesburg winter's morning was the sound of the Cape Robin outside my window sitting underneath the garden tap. And he used to make me feel slightly in touch with the wild. And I appreciated his songs every morning. Let's head across to Sam and find out about that leopard he was watching. So we are still on Biffleswood cut line, trying to locate on that leopard again. We were so lucky to see that leopard come back onto the road, do a couple of scent marks, and then it headed back into Biffleswood, and we are not able to go through there. But what we've decided to do, myself and Liam, is sit here and see if any movement comes back onto the road, either ahead of us or behind us. We are sitting on a crest. So we'll be able to look down to see if the leopard makes its way back to the road or back down behind us. Because what we've noticed this morning, since we saw the leopard twice, was the first time the leopard was walking in an easterly direction on the road. And then when it saw us, it headed back into the block. Then it decided to come back onto the road. And so we found him, found him again. So the behavior is that it's trying to get back to the road. So if we sit, ooh, let's hold on. Go ahead for Sam. So the, the, there's a number of stations that have gone. So there's a number of stations that have gone into the block now to see if they like, can locate on this animal. But the birds should be giving a nice call to us, letting us know that there's a leopard in the area. VM, did you hear something while I was on radio there? Yeah, I thought monkeys, but couldn't hear them again. VM thought he heard some monkeys, but he can't hear them again. It is so exciting to, to track a secretive cat like this. It makes the experience so much more rich and, and more... There's something about tracking something that doesn't want to be seen. But that was exciting. So we, we, we're going to sit here for a bit longer, two more minutes, and then we'll carry on, see what else we can find today. Sandy is asking me if I've ever had an experience where an animal, a predator of sorts, has come very close to the vehicle while I've been out here. Well, we sat last night with the four Birmingham males that were literally right next to the vehicle. Um, we, we didn't try purposely to go close to the, to the lines. We, we went a little bit ahead of them and then they got up and they went to the toilet and they just came and sat right next to us. And, that feeling of them being around you is, is, I can't even explain it. It kind of gets your adrenaline going a little bit. And, and two, three days ago, I had two of the Birmingham boys had a little scruffle between each other. And that noise they made, that sound, I don't know if you guys remember, but the sound was powerful, it was palpable. And 
it goes and resonates right straight through your body. So there's moments where you do feel alive when you're out here in the bush, especially when they are close to you. And Sandy, it's an unreal experience. And I'm hoping to one day be able to take you guys on an experience where the lions are roaring and showing people or showing the other lions their dominance to this land. So that'll be a day when that happens. But it seems that it is very quiet here now. And the other stations that are on the leopard, we'll see if they can find it. Otherwise, I'm not going to waste any more time. We've already seen three leopards this morning. I can't believe you were with the cubs. <sighs> James has been very lucky to be able to see so many of the different cubs. Well, the cubs twice in one day, twice in two days. I'm hoping that I can see them in the next couple of days. But, you know, there'll always be time. They're going to be growing up close to our property. It's so nice that Karula is bringing her cubs into our property, into Buyatela, really not far away from our camp as well, probably five minute drive to, to where the cubs are. So hopefully that'll grow. Michael, who is age 13, is asking, what do we do other than game drive in the morning and the afternoons? Well, yeah, so you can imagine we finished at Hoppers 8, 9 in the morning and only start again at 3.30 in the afternoon. So we've, we've got quite a fair game of touch rugby. I am scanning the wilderness, everybody, for signs of animal life, specifically atop of a termite mound over that side where I thought maybe I saw the ears of a leopard, but I didn't. I saw a diker come hurtling across the clearing here, and it has disappeared. Beautiful morning. Right, I think we are going to go to the hyena den leave this area for the next little while. And then we might pop across to Aratuza and see what's happening there. Okay, now of course, when I came along here this morning, I was hoping desperately that this Balanites tree, a stunning tree, would have the leopards in it, because it is the perfect kind of a tree for a leopard to be in, but they weren't there. They are, however, down by the fairy-like tree. If you've just joined us, I did, we did get a view of the cub, one cub, just moving away into the thick bushes. She heard the vehicle coming along, and so we decided to leave because we couldn't find the mum. And so with Karula away, we'll leave those cubs to be on their own. But this beautiful Balanites tree is exactly the kind of place you would expect to find a leopard. The other word, of course, for the Balanites tree is a torchwood. And it's called a torchwood because of the, because of the flammable oil. Well, it's apparently flammable that lives in the seed pod. And the flammable oil in the seed pod is so, uh, supposed to be so flammable that you can use it to make torches. Now, I have embarrassed myself on any number of occasions finding the seeds, breaking them open, putting a flame to them, and finding that they are basically about as flammable as asbestos. Which, in case you don't know, is not flammable at all. Cheryl, a very interesting one. We were talking about Johannesburg just now. And, uh, and if you don't know what just now means in South Africanese, it means uh, a few minutes ago as opposed to right now. And uh, so just now we were talking about Johannesburg and I was telling you about the birds there. 
And one of the big things that is appealing about Johannesburg is the fact that it's the largest urban forest in the world. And therefore, there are a lot of trees. And Cheryl, your question dovetails quite neatly with that because many of the oak trees there get a disease. And you want to know, can trees give each other a disease? Is there ever a cause to remove a tree because it might infect others? And as far as I know, Cheryl, I think I don't know that they will so much um, infect each other, but that if they're in the same area as a disease that affects a specific tree, it's highly likely that that disease, say it's a fungus, for example, will produce the spores that will then attach themselves to similar species of trees that would form their hosts. And the oak trees in Johannesburg, for example, have got a tremendous problem with something called a black mildew or black rot or something like that. And that really does affect them very badly. And it only seems to affect the oak trees. So I'm pretty sure that although they're not directly infecting each other, because like, unlike humans, they don't sort of uh, hug each other or kiss each other too much. But in being in close proximity, as the, you will find that the diseases that affect the trees out here will have a way of dispersing themselves to similar hosts. So be it through the wind or be it through animal vectors or something like that, which would then infect similar trees. So yes, I suppose in a very real manner, they can infect each other. Would there ever be a case or a reason for us to remove trees from this area? No, I don't think so. Not unless there was some kind of exotic disease that got in here that uh, came from, I don't know, some sort of, sort of anthropogenic effect or perhaps uh, it wasn't indigenous to the area. There are certainly some trees out here that do get diseases. I know marula trees get diseases every so often and you find them with wilting leaves and it looks like funguses growing out of all of the leaves and that does happen from time to time. So, well, we would never kind of remove the trees. Also, the mistletoe tends to, apparently the mistletoe, and especially in dry years, tends to affect the marula trees quite badly. Hello, Megan. While Brian shows you those rather spectacular looking white crowned shrikes there, which have now flown off. <laughs> uh, white crown shrikes have gone. There's just, there's some, you've got the one. There we go, white crown shrike. Megan, you're interested in anti-inflammatory properties of plants. Well, interestingly, I have a book here called People's Plants, and hopefully People's Plants will tell me. I think it's actually divided into sections depending on the ailment that you might have. Certainly when Andrew hit his head the other day on a Zizifus tree, we covered his wound in Zizifus. And it seemed to help. That's supposed to be a sort of good uh, anti... Well, it might be slightly anti-inflammatory, but it's also a good and disinfectant. Foods and drinks, health and beauty, women's health. No, we don't want that. Perfumes, cosmetics, mind and mood plants, tonic plant, general medicines. Should we try that one? Let's try the general medicines section. While you look at the white crowned shrike sitting as the sun attempts to peep its way up through the clouds. Mm, sedative, no. Malaria, venereal disease, no. Conjunctivitis. Purgative. Don't worry, we will find. Oh, here we go. Knee or joint pain. Balota africana. Not found here, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. So, Balota africana. That's not going to help us here. Nervous disorders. Uh, I can't find anything that is a particularly good, um, particularly good anti-inflammatory. I'll keep looking though. There is an antifungal. Many of these things, of course, are found not here, but are found up in the drier areas of the country. Isn't the light interesting, the way it's changing? Sort of turning yellow. So I think that it's probably only the Zizifus that is particularly good as an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. 
lots, like I say, lots of different plants within this book, but very few of them found here because many of them, many of these remedies are from the old Bushman remedies and they live up in much sort of much more dry areas than this hemorrhoids. I'm just going to quickly check the, the Zizifus. No, it's not even here. I will continue the search for the anti-inflammatory plants. There must be some out here, I'm sure. And I know that um, one of the, I ah, hear it's coming back to me, one of the acids, of course, that is found in aspirin is found in the bark of one of the trees out here, and I've forgotten which one that is. And aspirin, of course, is a very good anti-inflammatory. Right, that's this clearing. Let's move on from here. Why can I not remember that? There is actually this, it's all coming back to me. All right, while I try and get that back into my mind, let's go across to the younger Sam, whose mind is sharper. Come on, James, see if you can remember that word. I know that feeling, though, when all the words that you're trying to say just slip from your mind and you've got to talk on live TV about what you're trying to say. It's not the easiest thing in the world. But here we are sitting with another big spider nest, and they seem to be everywhere. And I just am so fascinated by them and the types of things that you can find in them. Often you'll see this seems quite inactive to the ones that I've been seeing recently, but we can often find 8, 10, 15 spiders at once on these big spider nests, and they are remarkable in the way in which they work together as a team, as a cooperative, to get the food that they need. And I was reading last night how community nest spiders, you know, they also sometimes eat each other. If situations got to the point where they needed food, the more dominant spiders will actually kill the other spiders in order to get the protein they need. It's highly interesting. Even just the, 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 you know, what was so cool, I don't know if you know this fact about how female, female spiders are the bigger, more dominant ones compared to the males. Often with spiders, the male is a lot smaller than the female and the male will do its best and he, he will like sit on the other side of the net and he sometimes will play with like what can we see here oh uh, have a look there so we were here last night with the birmingham boys and we, we've just found some lion dung so did you smell that or see it yeah. <laughs> it's not the nicest smell that you'll ever hear or oh, not here smell here come on sam that you'll ever smell anyway just saying with that with spiders like a, a male spider will sometimes string like play like a guitar with this with with its um with the female to kind of let it know that he might come and mate but yeah i can quite clearly smell that now anyway and play play with a string on the, on the net to show the female that he's coming in and then he comes in quickly tries to to plant his seed and then most of the time gets eaten by the female so it's not, not such a great relationship between sometimes the female and the male spider but i just want to go back to that question by michael michael who's 13 years old wanted to talk about what we do in between drives well michael we do all sorts of things i mean for me I've mainly been trying to catch up on all the different things that I need to learn from the roads that we are, because I've got a feeling we're coming up to Buffelshook Dam now. So I had to learn the different roads. I had to learn the scientific names of plants, medicinal uses of plants. I've had to go back into all my studies, because I haven't been in the bush for two years since I've been here. So I literally go on drive, go into my room, do a couple, couple readings, and then I'll definitely do some exercise. So we played touch rugby yesterday, which is my favorite sport. Touch rugby, I don't know if you know the game. It's a great game. Um, otherwise, I just go for a long run, probably like five to 10 kilometers, have lunch, laugh with everyone, drink some water, have a quick snooze, and get back out of there and see what else we can find in the bush. So that's a typical day, wouldn't you say, Viem? What do you do in your days, Viem? Uh. Do maintenance, log footage, 
news. Exactly. So it's very different. You know, as a presenter, I've got to build my knowledge and get a, little, a bit more understanding. VM's got to try and fix all the technology and make sure that, you know, lock on all the, the footage that we've taken over the last few weeks because he is the filmer behind the lens. VM behind the lens. And here we come. We're coming into Buffelsuk. Here we come. We are coming into the... Oh, we've got a hippo. We've got a hippo. We've got some Egyptian geese. This... Let's have a little look at this hippo. Was it two? Let's have a good look. We have two there. It looks like a youngster that's there with its mother. Wow, we haven't, I haven't seen a young hippo in ages. And the young hippos are not as good swimmers as the females, well, as the mothers, because they're still young and they haven't really developed the ability to swim yet. So that's why you can see that the youngster is putting its head on top of its mother, trying to get that flotation and support that it needs. Oh, that's very cool that we can see a young hippo. In the distance, we can see some Egyptian goose or geese. And you'll often find them in pairs because they are monogamous. Monogamous. <laughs> so we call a group of hippos what? What do you think we call a group of hippos? Please, hashtag Safari Live. Let us know what you think a group of hippos is. We had an incredible sighting the other day down by Sydney's dam where a hippo was in the distance and we had the four male lions. So all four male, male lions, the Birmingham boys got up and they started to stretch and in the distance there was a hippo outside of water that, I don't know, I felt very... Ooh, hold on, let's have a look at these feeding. You can see ooh, these um, yellow-billed hornbills are feeding inside the bark of this tree. They go inside and collect all the insects that they might find. And that's an iconic birds of the bush, these hornbills. You get the yellow-billed hornbill and the red-billed hornbill. They are already on my bird list, so we don't have to write down the yellow-billed hornbill. But how cool do they look in that old tree, the old knobthorn tree? And you can see all the bark has been stripped on this tree and there is some dirt that's collected around it, and that's most likely because of termites that are starting to eat the inside of the tree. Nature in India was asking uh, well, not, not only asking and saying thanks for that leopard, that leopard was great. But I, can I just get this, the first part of that question again, please, Louise? Are they kingfishers? Yes, that's exactly what I heard. Are they kingfishers? Do you know, they are my favorite birds of all time, those kingfishers. I mean, so purely because I've seen them in different parts of the world, from England, where I was in Devon, to here in Southern Africa, and also in Brazil when I was traveling down the Amazon River and the Pantanal. And I saw kingfishers and they're incredible birds. We get them here, we get three, two different groups. We get insect eating uh, kingfishers and we get the fish eating kingfishers. So those are the fish, the fish eating will, are the, the ones that we see here are the pied kingfisher and the malachite kingfisher and the giant kingfisher. If we get to see those, it's, they are beautiful, especially the malachites. Malachites are a lot smaller, and you'll see them just sitting. If you look closer, you'll have that, that those colors will just glimmer, and you'll see them, and you know, it's an incredible kingfisher to see. And they're amazing because of the way in which they dive into the water, catch their fish, and eat. And why I also like that is just from a design point of view, because I really enjoy design. I did my master's in ecological design thinking at Schumacher College in England, and we focused on natural designs and how those natural designs influence every, the, every kind of human system. So they actually mimic that kingfisher's beak so that onto a train in, the, I think it was in India, 
uh, it, wasn't, no, it wasn't in India, it was in Japan. And that kingfisher's beak is now on the front of a train because it is much easier for that train to now go through tunnels than it was before. So it's moving from one solid to another solid. And that kingfisher's beak has done it so well. It's done it for thousands and thousands of years. So we can really learn from the designs of the natural world to make our world a little bit more efficient. So thanks for bringing that up. I love kingfishers. Jody and Pretty Nightmare is saying that they call it a pod of hippos. That is correct. Well done. I also used to call them a float. So you can either call them a float or a pod of hippos. That is a group. So there's just two over there. The female and the young. So can we, are we able to get closer to, the, to that young? So we fill in. Full in. So hopefully I'll see if I can get to a position where we can have another shot of that youngster, but let's go and see how James is doing with the hyenas. We're still driving towards the hyena den, everyone, and we haven't managed to find anything with a heartbeat since then. We did see a ground scraper thrush, which uh, flew off, obviously, but I did find out about a possibly anti two possibly anti-inflammatory plants. The first is aloe. Now we know that aloe vera is used for a number of different things. Indeed, so ooh, there's some zebra. Indeed, Sam has got aloe vera toothpaste, believe it or not. That's why he smells like an indigenous forest most of the day. Um, beautiful dazzle of zebra here and you'll find that they are looking slightly disconcerted because they are standing around where the Birmingham boys, the four remaining, were lying just two days ago and I think you'll find that their ears are pricked forward because they can smell the lions. I've no doubt they can smell the evil smelling dung that the lions produce and they're not paying us any attention whatsoever. This is a big group. I suspect it's two kinship groups so two stallions and their wives. What's that one eating? That one is licking the bark of that tree, everyone. Or oh, scratching his... No, he's not. He's scratching his lip. <laughs> this is so bizarre. You can see them staring intently into the bush. I'm pretty sure it's because they can smell the lions from last time. I don't think there's anything in there. But they are standing in a defensive position. Two or three of them facing forward. Two or three of them facing backward, but some of them eating. Isn't that interesting? Normally they'd pay attention to whatever was the kind of greatest threat that they felt there was, and that would normally be us. And there they are, viciously fighting, biting each other. <laughs> they are not nice to each other, Zebra, they really aren't. And their teeth and jaws are vicious. It's a really nice Zebra sighting. I can't remember having one since I got back from my leave. Look, 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 look. come out, they've decided the lions are not there, so they're going to trot off two youngsters, hopefully into the clearing here. Yeah, and there are two stallions that have stayed back, no, one stallion, no, they're not, they're both mares that stayed back just to see make sure that there weren't any lions in the thicket there where they've left their stink. Let's just sneak a little bit forward. We might get a better view.
She was trying to identify who's who in this kinship group. Those look to be all mares in front of us. And that one there, now closest to us, is the stallion. And that, of course, is the classic way in which a zebra will, herd will travel. The experienced oldest female up front, male at the back, to look after any potential threat, because of threat will almost always, for a zebra, come from the behind. I think this might actually be one family. I think he's managed to get himself four or five wives. They've all had a foal or two. He's living like a Zulu king of old. I always find that they, especially when I was a youngster, I used to think, well, zebra looks so so sort of sweet they look like the kind of animal you'd really like to have uh, around your home not so you saw the two of them biting each other there and they're notorious for biting people as well and they've all got itchy lips <laughs> Well, exactly, Megan. This is precisely what um, I used to think. You say you love zebra because they remind you of the horses that you ride and you feel like you can understand them through your understanding of horse behavior. Yeah, I, I would agree with you to a certain extent, Megan, except to say that a zebra is a lot more vicious than a domestic horse. I know a domestic horse can be quite vicious, but these chaps really are, are not particularly nice. And while their behaviours are absolutely interpretable from the point of view of domestic horses' behaviour, they certainly herd in the same way that a wild horse will herd with a harem structure. They go to the loo in the same way. Well done, Brian. Very nice. Thank you. They leave the same kind of dung. <laughs> that is the usual story, isn't it? I think that you'll find that there are certain certain differences, but yes, many will be the same. That's nice, Brian. Ooh, now what? Something has given them a fright. You see how the stallion waits behind to see what the threat is? I suspect they just got a whiff of those lines again. I think that's all that was. Let's just go forward. They're all looking in here, but they're not alarm calling. And a zebra alarm calls in much the same way that a wildebeest will. <laughs> and Jen, you say zebra always look so perfectly groomed. Yes, they do. I agree with you. I think they, you know, they're one of the few antelope, or antelope, they're one of the few herbivore species that actually does quite a lot of what we call aloe grooming. So they do kind of condition each other's skin, but not extensively. I think most of the animals out here, other than the waterbuck, look pretty well groomed. Waterbuck always look a bit scruffy. Waterbuck and tawny eagles. There, yeah, they're going to just move away now. Astralina, um, all in parlor and are jumping around. There's Mike taking his kids to school. <laughs> well, that was very well avoided, Brian. I'm thanks by that. Um, Astralina, you say you reckon that there are fewer ticks on zebras than there are on some of the other antelope. Could that be because of their stripes? Well, there is that fairly outlandish theory that the reason zebra have stripes is to get rid of ticks that the ticks are attracted to the to the black part and then they fall off or something like that i'm not sure what it is exactly i don't think they've got any fewer ticks on them than the impala do for example do they have fewer ticks than those buffalo bulls yeah they do um i certainly haven't seen as many as i have on buffalo bulls 
but I'm not sure if you compare the ticks that they have to, com for example, with these Impala that are with them now. Let me just get into a clearing where Brian can get a decent shot of them. I'm not sure that they have any fewer ticks than the Impala, for example. This is wonderful. We've got Impala chasing each other around here. And of course, we're supposed to be in the middle of the Impala right now. I think it's been a very subdued rut this year. I really do. I don't think there's been nearly as much activity as there is normally. So just back to you, Astralina. Um, there is that other theory that if we, as we look at these impalas, that the black stripe behind their tail is uh, an attraction for ticks because it's warmer. And so the ticks are attracted to that black stripe behind the tail. And then because they wag their tails in that region, the ticks are excluded from the body or knocked off. And, I mean, I guess it's relatively plausible. I'm not sure how well researched it is. I think the most, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that no other animal that has to deal with parasites out here should have stripes except the zebra. Well, that said, I mean, no other animal has stripes like this for camouflage, or it's not camouflage for sort of dazzling and confusing predators. That foal is no longer a foal and is taking chances. Eesh, they get vicious. And I suppose this would be quite something to see. Imagine seeing a zebra with no black stripes, be purely white. And Marcel, you're wondering about an albino zebra. Has an albino zebra ever been recorded? I don't know, Marcel. Um, I imagine it's possible, as it is in most species that we get out here. So it's quite possible that an albino zebra has been born and found. An albino zebra, of course, would have a pink nose there, would have a, a pink skin. So it would be pure white, it would have a pink skin, and therefore would probably not survive out here. You cannot survive out here in the wild without melanin. Without melanin, your skin will very quickly succumb to the African sun. It's quite sweet. And there we go, Gen B. Brilliant question. Brilliant. Well pointed out. You say if zebra aloe groom a lot, which they do, surely that would take care of a lot of the ticks. Yeah, absolutely it would. Which buffalo don't do. No, they don't. That's absolutely correct. It's interesting, I mean, ox peckers will sit on zebra, and they do eat the ticks off the zebra, but they also sit on buffalo, and buffalo seem to be more tick riddled. And I was reading about ox peckers yesterday, and apparently, you know, they don't uh, necessarily make an appreciable difference to the parasite load that animals have to take. So we've often thought of it as being this kind of mutual or symbiotic mutualism or symbiotic relationship that the ox peckers and the other animals have. That's not necessarily the case. It might be more parasitic than it is symbiotic. Now the herd is heading off towards Sydney's dam, probably to have a drink. And Megan, you're wondering, obviously, you have farriers out to come and see your horse's feet, attend to them, blacksmiths in the old days. And you wonder how on earth zebra managed to keep their foot growth under control, because yes, as you are correctly guessing, the hooves do grow continuously, as they do with all the animals out here. It's just use, Megan. The only reason that they don't have to have a farrier out here to chop their feet is that they are moving all the time. And so their hooves... Well, I've no doubt some of them are long, sort of uh, longer and some of them are shorter than others, depending on various times of the year and the terrain they're moving over. It is use over the hard stony ground that keeps the foot growth under control. This is quite interesting. Just watch that. I thought that that zebra was starting to look slightly like he was excited. He's... um. 
he's just exhibiting what we call the Fleming display there. He's opening his lips to check if a female is ready to mate. Let's head across to Sam. He's got some other wonderful antelope to show you. Some kudu out here in the bush, and we can see a youngster. Have a look at the young kudu that is next to its mother there. Sweet, so, so young. Look, it's, oh, I think it's trying to get some milk from its mother. I'm going to try and see if I can get another position where you can see that better. Ooh, that little branch has just got in the way now. But that's so cool. Look at the, young, the small stripes on its back. It's got a lot more prominent on the youngster than it is on the mother, just darker. But look at the, the mother's got its ears out looking for any danger, listening and looking for anything that might be in this area. We know that the lions were here last night, so they must be very aware and alert if they heard them rustling through the bushes during the night. And no doubt they were scent marking and making a large noise. And we've been very, very privileged to see young animals over the last few days. We saw a very young elephant playing in the water yesterday morning and we've seen two baby cubs, two baby leopard cubs and now we're with a young kudu. The most difficult time of its life is when it's young. You can see it's trying to drink the milk from the mother. Can't get into another position, so we can only actually see that. You can see just in that screen that, that she's moving the bottom there, moving the utter. The udder, not utter. <laughs> Getting that young, that milk that will bring the calcium to build her bones. Siberia Zumi wants to know, what is the smallest to the largest antelope that can be seen in the Sabi Sands? Quickly, just while we're just looking at the mother, look how she's moving her ears from left to right. It's incredible how they can pick up on any sound that's going on around. And, you know, going back to that question, is, is the largest that we can find out here in the Sabi Sands is exactly the one that we are looking at now. It is the kudu. So when you see a male kudu, have a look at the size of the horns of a kudu and its actual build. It's a big, big, big antelope out here in the bush. And the smallest one that we get is either between the Steenbok and the, the common daker. But I'm th I think it is the Steenbok that is smaller than the common daker. We can actually have a look in my mammals book to see what the difference is between the Steenbok and the common daker. So I'll show you the male kudu as well in this book to show you how big its horns can get. It's incredible how big its horns get. Okay, steer and bulk. So this is a Steenbok. Just carry on looking at that youngster though. It's cool. We've got very good visual of that. So when we've done looking at the youngster, we'll show you the difference between the biggest and the smallest antelope out here in the bush. And the mother has to be so protective over these stages. The, the, the male will come in every now and then to be with the social groups, but mainly it's going to be the mother and the youngster on their own archer. Often the females will pair with other mothers archer to help with security from more hearing and more sight. And that will give the best chance for all the youngsters to grow up into young adults so that they can then defend themselves in this territory. There's a very, there's loads of predators in, the, in this area, from the lion to the leopard 
to the wild dog, they will be looking to eat something very much like that young kudu over there. So they have to be so careful and be aware of their environment all the time. I can only imagine what it must be at night, like at night time when it gets very dark. Aaron in New Zealand was asking, do I have a specific favorite antelope that I love? Well, there's two. Two, I really, really, really enjoy the Inyala, purely because the Inyala has such a significant sexual dimorphism between the female and the male, that it looks like it's wearing a really big coat, that male Inyala. So I really enjoy watching the Inyalas, but when I spent time out in Cedarburg, I had a antelope called a clipspringer and I used to go into the mountains and look for the clipspringer. Mainly I would go looking for the Cape Leopard but I would go find the prey source which was the clipspringer and I would follow the, the clipspringer around for a while and I used to watch them hop from rock to rock so I've actually can get you a pic on a picture of that. This is quickly the smallest of the bucks out here which is the Steenbok. Look how small he is. And they also have some sexual dimorphism. As you can see, this is the male, a Steenbok ram. It has horns. And that is the, uh, the female, which doesn't have horns. So we saw two Steenboks yesterday on, on live TV, which was very, very exciting. You can see that they like to be in pairs. You'll often find them in mon monogamous pairs. So often when you see the Steenbok, look for the other one because the other one might be very, very close behind it. The clip springer is right here. That's my favorite small antelope. Have a look at it. It's got those very, very short, small little horns over there. Small little horns, and they love to be in the rocky areas. That's where the, the name of it comes. Clip springer means rock, rock jumper, and has quite a stocky appearance and can jump and hop from rock to rock very, very effectively. So, Aaron in New Zealand, I really enjoy the Inyala and I enjoy the Clip Springer, but as I spend more time with all the different other antelope like the Kudu and the Common Daker, I'm in Excited to learn a little bit more about everything that's out here. Okay. Katie is asking probably the best question, or well, for me, I love cons learning about conservation. I love talking and, and listening to different conservationists from the past to the present. It's my passion in terms of, you know, the way in which we have a relationship to the greater community of wild beings out here. And I'm glad to hear, Katie, that Jane Goodhall has been a big inspiration to you over your time. Jane Goodall was also a really, really big inspiration to me. When I was studying at Schumacher, she, she took part in a lot of the courses that we were doing there. I never got to meet her, but I was, I thoroughly enjoyed all her different different ways in which you would communicate messages of sustainability and conservation. My favorite conservationist of all time is Aldo Leopold. Um, just because of the way in which Aldo Leopold understood his conservation, how he understood the land ethic. I mean, if you have time, he's an American, of course. He was an American. And I wrote many papers, which you can actually find out, find on the internet if you go to academia.edu. I wrote a paper uh, where I walked from a part of England all the way down to the coast in, con in conversation with Aldo Leopold. And one of the greatest quotes that I loved about Aldo Leopold is, you know, when we begin to see the land not as a commodity in which we can draw from, but rather as a community in which we live, then that will bring us to a closer understanding of conservation. So when we begin to see ourselves as part of a community, and I think that's such a powerful message to, to every single person that's, you know, whatever age you're at, but especially the youngsters, if we can the, the bring in this 
this, the, the idea that the natural world is part of this community, this ecology that we are a part of and not above, then we'll start to see just everything else thrive around us rather than us dominating over it. So thank you for that question, Katie. And if you ever have any other questions on conservation or any around those things, like from John Muir, I would love to talk about that sort of stuff. It's, it's what gives me energy. But with that, let's go and see what James is doing. Myself and VM are going to look to see if we can find some tracks of some cheetah, some leopard, and potentially some lions. See you in a moment. Well, we're heading now towards the hyena den, and I'm just hoping that there are going to be some hyenas here. I suppose we're a little bit late, but it is a cool morning. And there were lots of hyena tracks on the road coming in here. Although, popping out the other side, on I think, were the male leopard tracks of the one you guys saw earlier with Sam. So, you know, any other predators coming through this area will result in the little ones disappearing inside and not coming out. And I don't see any. I haven't seen them for a long time now. Nothing, Brian, nothing. But lots of fresh tracks. So I think we're just timing these visits wrong. So I'm pretty sure they're still in here. Although, there seem to be quite a lot of plants growing out of that hole there. But I'm pretty sure that they are still here. So the little ones will be inside, the adults will be off having a graze. A graze. A feed. <laughs> leave here and Jennifer while we drive out of here of course one of the reasons I said we I thought we'd missed them the other day was that the male lions had come basically through this area and that the adults had probably scarpered off and the little ones had gone inside and you say is it detrimental to the hyenas having so many male lions around um, Jennifer yes certainly the number of male lions that are around will affect the hyena distribution and the number of hyenas in the clan probably but there aren't so many male lions around. I don't think that there's an unusual concentration of male lions at the moment. I think they're a pretty standard issue concentration. Yes, there are two more than there were when the Motimbas were in charge, but their territory is consequently larger down towards the south. So, yeah, I don't think that there's, there's necessarily an effect. But there would be were there to be even further male lions and female lions. And you find, quite interestingly, where that huge clan around Arethusa, Brent and I were chatting about it the other day, where that huge clan exists, there are over 50 adults in that clan. There are no sort of resident lion prides around where that clan lives. So the Inkahumas pop through there every so often, but not very often. And so they don't seem to exist around there at all because of the number of hyenas. So they do affect each other. And they, they kind of alternate at the top of the predator hierarchy for who is the top dog or cat, as the case may be. Ha ha ha. The other interesting thing, talking of dogs, is that the male, or not male, is that the... Sorry. Is that the wild dogs were coming south from Manuleti yesterday. Uh, and there only apparently are eight left in the Investec pack. There were 11. So uh, they seem to have lost either the three adults or the three adults have pressed on and left the eight youngsters on their own. I don't know about that, but apparently there was a fight there. Some of them got bite marks on them. So it'll be interesting to see when they arrive back here. Angie, I said a little while back today that a coalition of nine male lions would not survive. And you say, why not? Well, the answer is simply because there wouldn't be enough females to satisfy them. Their territory would have to be so enormous in order for them to have, you know, the prides sufficient to keep them together that the... You know, lots of baby hyena tracks around here as well. That the coalition would inevitably split 
into smaller groups of maybe four and five, but much more likely into threes. Uh, that's the sort of, that tends to be what happens. They would then set up rival territories and they may once or twice end up together, meeting each up, meeting up, and you'd see them all together. But once they are fully adult, once they're sort of six, seven, eight years old, the chances of seeing all nine of those males together will plummet drastically because they'll set up their own territories in groups of threes and fours maybe and that will be it. So even the Majingalan coalition which has been dominant in much of the Sabi sands for uh, what now probably about five years which is a long time they too don't are very seldom seen together they do as a coalition dominate the whole western sector of the Sabi sands but you very seldom see all four of them together they're normally in twos and sometimes in three and one. But they'd certainly do rally together if there's any trouble. And apparently when the Matimbas moved in there, um, which continues to astound me given that they made no attempt to defend this area whatsoever, they, uh, the Majingalan called the, and they came together as a coalition of four again. So I think nine of them though, that would just be too many for that to happen. They'd be too far widely spread for them to, you know, coalesce often and defend a territory as nine. I hope that answers your question, Angie. We're just going to ease our way along the fire break here towards Mvubu Road. And I thought maybe we should head towards Arethusa. What do you think, Brian? In fact, let's do that. Let's go to Arethusa. We'll go up this little shortcut road here onto the Biffles of Cut Line past Sydney's Dam. We'll go and have a find out what's going on in Arethusa this morning. Maybe little Shadow is around. Shadow, of course, it's now the 25th of April, so in about five days or so, her cubs will be two months old, roughly, and we will then actively start looking for them. Like we have with Karulas. Ah, I see. Now, Jen, apparently your question was slightly misinterpreted. You're not so much interested in the effect of the lions on hyenas, but more on would a large group of hyenas like that affect them, which dovetails quite nicely with our discussion on what's happening with the, uh, with the male lions and a big, a big coalition of male lions. Um, I think, Jen, yes, in a certain area it would. I think 50 is probably about the size limit. I've never heard of a hyena clan that big in this area. In East Africa, where they hunt more than they do scavenge, then clans of 50 are not that unusual. Here, it's extremely unusual. And I suspect they must be doing a huge amount of hunting rather than scavenging uh, around Simbambili and down into Arethusa and Elephant Plains, because to sustain a clan of 50 will be very difficult just with scavenging. I think our guys do largely scavenging. I don't think they do a huge amount of hunting. And they probably do some, but I don't think they do an enormous amount. Very nice question, that. I'm just gonna keep an eye on the road because there were some male lion and male leopard tracks coming over here. And Nate, you're a new viewer. Wonderful to have you with us. I think you asked us about becoming a safari person earlier this morning, or oh, that may have been a different Nate. Uh, you're interested in hyena packs and who leads them. Nate, a hyena clan, and I'm very sad that we haven't gone to or managed to find them at the den there, because this would have very nicely explained to you how the social structure works. A hyena clan is led by the females, and by a matriarch specifically, and every single female in the clan is more dominant and ranks higher than every single male. So the males are the downtrodden of a hyena society. They spend very little time at the den unless they're fairly closely related to dominant females. And so completely unlike any other mammal species that I know of, they're dominated by the females. Yes, elephants live in matriarchal societies where the herd is led by a female, but she doesn't dominate the clan in the same way that a female hyena does. I 
I was reading something very interesting the other day, and I just need to tell you about it once I've asked Jen's, answered Jen's question. Jen, you are interested in whether or not the hyenas could have leaved, uh, could have left, given that the lions were around there yesterday. Uh, yes, it's possible. It is possible, but there were fresh tracks there, and so I don't think they have. Those tracks look to be like they were made this morning, and I'm sure all that's happened is that the adults have come back, fed the youngsters, and they've dispersed. And of course, as those youngsters get older, so the adults will spend less and less time in the den, and so the chances of us seeing them are going to be that much smaller. We're going past Sydney's dam here. While we do that, if there's anything, you can come back to us. Otherwise, let's go and see what Sam's got to show you. Here we go through the drainage line. As James, I was sitting on the back of James's vehicle about two days ago, taking some notes on how to do a school drive, which was fun. And we went through here, and he said it's like being in a boat, going down the river system. Because you can just not even hold on to your, in your car. You don't have to touch your wheel, and your car will take you in the direction because of the ruts that have already been formed. So we're going on a little boat cruise down through the drainage line to see if we might find any small animals, potentially some secretive animals, potentially a black-headed oriole, which I've been hearing this morning. We've just seen one that just flew right past us now. This is a common area where you'll find that liquid calling bird, 100% my favorite bird out here in the bush to listen to. I could fall asleep to that bird every day if I could. Something went walking through there. Megan from Ottawa would like me to talk through some of the biometric or biomimicry around looking at the design of a pangolin. That's very interesting, Megan from Ottawa. Well, you know, as, as the way in which biomimicry works, which is it's much easier for me to explain sometimes with my book, but I'll see if I can try and explain. Biomimicry is essentially looking at the design and seeing how it uses and how it perfects that design in order to create a more efficient system. So for example, what is the pangolin doing with its design that helps it survive? Well, let's just think about to a ball and Right, we're just going past the Sabi Sands Gate, everybody, the far, very far northwestern edge of our traversing. And we're now going to head down towards Arethusa and get an update from them. I will try and get that update while you are listening. I have to switch on another radio now. We're very skilled with this sort of thing. Wild Earth, East, West, we want. Channel 2. Oh, dear. I wonder which it is. Uh, here we go, west. Good morning, stations, Arethusa. May I have an update for the morning? Oh, that's the wrong radio. That's Louise. Louise does not know what's been seen on Arethusa. Good morning, stations, Arethusa. Any updates for the morning? A deathly silence, Brian. We're not close enough yet. We'll have to get a little bit closer before we get an idea. While we do that, Brian, look at this remarkable little inchworm. He doesn't look very enthusiastic about his life, and I suspect that's because, of course, he's quite cold. He's cold-blooded, which means for him to move in these kind of conditions is difficult. It has not warmed up at all. Don't fall off, little fellow. 
these colors, isn't that remarkable? Is that what he likes to eat? Sorry, that was my head. That was my head again. The one thing I do want you to note, if you don't mind, everybody, is the fact that he has got six legs. Only six legs in the front. And behind, things that look like legs are not legs at all. They are suckers. And they just help him to move. And, of course, when he's an adult, which he will be a moth or a butterfly, he will have six legs. And those suckers will have disappeared along with his caterpillar-like body. Seems to be struggling to get over my hair there. You see that, Brian? I do. Poor fellow. It's like walking through a an enormous field of spiky grass. <laughs> I always find a close-up of a human being's skin hair to be extremely unattractive, and I'm, I'm fully with that as initial assessment. Brian, do you see the injuries on my hand there? Mm. Those injuries come from a knob thorn tree, Brian. Yeah. I tried to hack a branch off the other day. Right, I'm going to th put him into the bush. Go well, be free, little caterpillar. Don't be eaten by a bird. There were a few spots of rain that hit us earlier. I'm not sure we're going to have any more of that, but it is quite misty. And I thought initially this morning that the air was going to clear and that it would be quite a hot day, but it isn't at all. Brian, is that something exciting on the road or is it a bush? It's a bush. This is a very interesting question, Barbara. What a very clever question. You're in Washington. Yesterday, everyone, for those of you who weren't watching the afternoon safari, we saw a buffalo calf that was injured and it was limping along. And I said that it would be immediately targeted by predators if the, target, if the predators came across the herd. And Barbara, your question is, would predators here obviously target a disabled human being if they were to be on foot around here? I think the answer is yes, absolutely they would. Uh, remember, though, that while, sorry, I'm just, the radio is now starting to work in my ear. Uh, human beings, of course, are seen as predators. So it's not like we are seen as prey. So yes, while lions, I no doubt, would pick up on a disability in a human being, because they will pick up on limping, they'll pick up on kind of a, a general malaise, they pick up on a general, a, the general body condition and I think the energy that a sick person or a disabled person might give out, they, they do still see us as predators. So I don't think it would immediately invite an attack like it would if the lion saw that baby buffalo. They would immediately invite them to attack. With a human being, because we're predators, they'd probably just be slightly less fearful of us, maybe. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Certainly at night time, I remember uh, when one of the first trainers I ever had said to me, you know, when you walk around at night, you look like an idiot because you don't, you can very clearly not see. And there's no question that a predator can see if you're walking around at night that you're not looking where he is. So, I mean, if you walk past a lion in the middle of the night, straight past it and the lion crouches down like that and you don't behave like you've seen it, well, it's obviously going to pick up on that. And I think the similar kind of principle goes across to somebody who is perhaps disabled and on foot. So lions and leopards definitely pick up on our inability and our weaknesses. They know at night that we are far weaker than we are during the day, that we don't see properly. All right, let's go across to Samuel, who's got a frog-eating bird.
So we are sitting with two frog-eating birds. You can see that there, there's one to the left and one to the right, and they are waders. So what they do is, you can see he's playing with his legs there, he's trying to get all the little froggies, all the fishies to come out, and then he dips his beak in and catches them. He's giving us a great demonstra demonstration. I'm not sure if it's if it's a male and a female. It could very well be both. But hammercorps have the most incredible looking nests, which I'm not sure if there is a nest on the property. I hope I can, well, I'll go back to camp and ask James to see if there is one, as I'd love to show you it. Often hammercorps will create very, very large nests that they will make with any kind of debris they find. It's great to watch them. Look at them playing with their legs in the water. And they get that name Hammer Kop from, from the name Hammerhead. So it almost looks like their head's a hammer, if you have a look at that crest behind them. And much like the kingfisher that we were chatting about a little bit earlier, it has a very, very defined beak that is able to collect and catch things as they move in the water. You can see he's just eating, he's waiting, waiting and eating the him or her. Which is, I don't know how you can tell the sexual dimorphism between the two. Quite clearly see them see them dipping in there and collecting whatever it is that's in that water. Either it be a small little fish, a frog, or some insects that are on top of the surface. But just before you guys came live, we had a bird that was sitting in here that we haven't seen before. And I was very, very surprised to have seen it. So we were unlucky to have got it live. But I just want to show it to you quickly, and hopefully we'll get to see it again. It was the... It looked to me as if it was the great egret, which is this one over here. Very, very big looking bird. But I didn't get enough time to see if it was either the great egret or the yellow-billed egret. So it could, it could either be one of the two. And hopefully we'll be able to see that big white bird not so long from now, we'll be able to tell what it was and we'll be able to write that on the bird list. Of course, I'm not going to write it on my bird list. You need to be with me when I find everything out here so that it is a little bit more fair. Just going back to that question on biomimicry and the pangolin, if you could just... That was from Megan in Ottawa. Can we just go to... I just want to quickly show this, Megan, just so that it can help you. I know that there's quite a lot of writing in here, but if we just focus on here, we can see biomimicry from three different ways. So we can either see it as a model, so understanding nature as a model, which means what is that emulation? Emulation is the mimicry. How do we understand the design of something that then can be used within the human system to make our systems more efficient? Secondly, we could see nature as a measure. How is the function of that animal, the function of that design, able to endure for a long time? So if you can imagine polar bears that are in the Arctic or in the, in the North Poles, how do they able to, to endure those long winters? You know? And that's because of the thick coats that they're able to have. So, we can get inspiration from nature by understanding the way in which it is designed to endure things. And finally, you can see biomimicry from a mentorship point of view, in terms of its, if it's from the source of ideas. How does, how does nature teach us many, many different things from, from learning the way in which mothers are to their youngsters, to understanding prior dynamics, to understanding behavior. So there's many, many different ways in which you could learn biomimicry and understand it in the world. So just one last thing. Over here, we can see that the Earth has been here for three, or over 3.8 billion, billion years. And so we are only now, through Janine Benyus from 
from America who coined the term biomimicry is starting to see that we can bring design of the natural world into the many, many different forms of life. So when you're looking at a pangolin and I'm trying to understand the design of a pangolin, you know, try and understand how not only that that shell is made, what is it made for and how is it able to endure for that long and what is what does that do for the pangolin throughout its life. So there's many ways that biomimicry can teach us things. For me, I don't even like to say the word biomimicry because it's quite, I think the best word to say that it, it's quite scientific for something that's so obvious. So life, biomimicry is basically draw, drawing, drawing inspiration from life, understanding life a little bit better. How is this buffalo thorn tree got these shapes and designs in the way in which it has those thorns able to help it to you know be a part of this world how is the anything from the bird to the tree from these crested franklins very sweet crested franklins that are running around us over here they have a very significant call. loud loud noise We've just found the egret. Okay, it, just over there, we saw the bird that we were with just now. How exciting. Either the great or the little egret, we can tell by looking at the different colors. So we can see a prominent yellow beak. Just while we uh, reposition to see if we can get a, a better shot, let's see how James is doing. We'll see you in just a few moments. There is a hippopotamus, everybody. And that's quite unusual because it's in Red Dam, which is a sort of puddle here on Arethusa. I'm just getting an update while you look at that. Lepidon Elephant Plains, the Anderson male, has killed a baby buffalo and pulled it into a tree. That's unbelievable. So he's obviously a very, very large leopard indeed. I know some of you have seen him, I haven't. And for those of you who don't know, um, and the Anderson male is the dominant male of the West. <clears throat> Very large fellow, probably at least 90 kilograms. At 200 pounds. This, this dam has obviously just been pumped because there was no water in it and the hippo has somehow found it. I suspect he comes from the rapidly diminishing Arethusa Dam, which is in front of the lodge. And as that diminishes, so the young bulls like this will be forced to seek water elsewhere to try and lie in. Anyway, that's what's happening here. Then just across the way, we've got some blacksmith lapwings. And because Brian has got the punching zoom, let's have a look at them. Papao. Hmm. <laughs> It's just so lovely to be able to see them in this kind of detail. Look at those legs. That's what my legs look like, everybody. Not quite as long, but the same width. And the other thing you can see as he walks along there is the fact that he doesn't have a back toe. You see that? No back toe, only three front-facing toes. That must be the female. Look how elegantly she's standing. They're both doing the same. And they don't have a back toe because they catch their food largely by running along the ground. And a back toe on a bird slows it down. And so while 
many birds have got back toes, some two back toes. Those that live on the ground and course after their prey, so run after their prey on the ground, will normally have three forward-facing toes and no back toe. I think it's gone, Brian. Amazing how quickly they fly off. All righty, let's move along from here. We're going to head down to the south of Arethusa and then back towards Juma. And I'm just before the end of drive, I'm going to go and have one last look around where Karula was. <laughs> Dave, you reckon that we see red-billed hornbills Far less frequently, I'm going to carry on talking to you while I just try and harvest some fruits here, uh, far less frequently than we see yellow build. Dave, I'm not sure that that's the case. Is that your impression, Brian? Dave, I, I think that uh, it's my impression that they're probably about the same number. I suspect, though, that they might be just a little bit more nervous of the vehicles and the yellow build because they're slightly smaller and maybe then you know they don't sit for as long but i'm pretty sure that they that they are both around as much as each other now this is zizi for smokrenata the buffalo thorn vicious thorns but these um these seeds are used as a coffee substitute i'm not going to attempt to use them but brian and i are going to sample them to see what they taste like Apparently, they're quite nice when they get to this stage. Ryan, would you like to try one? They don't look that appealing, do they? No. They look like a sort of rotten raisin. Well, a little bit of sugary sweetness. Bad, actually. I hope so. Hmm. Um, yeah, not too bad. What do you think? Mm, okay. nice, nice and sweet. Um, just as Brian is asking the question there, he's asking a very valid question. Am I sure it's edible? I am sure that this one's edible. But just be careful, those of you, especially youngsters, but also adults, don't go into the wilderness and just eat anything you find and got yourself into big trouble. It is actually quite nice. Hmm, that's the buffalo thorn, Zizi for smokrenata. And apparently you can roast these up and crush them and they make quite a good coffee substitute. There you are. That's what they look like. Ah, punch zoom. Brian, that looks like a, I think it looks like an arrangement from a sort of professional recipe book, don't you? Mm, amazing. Good job. Let me plug myself back in. Beautiful. Mm. Well done, Brian. All right, on we go. I've just plugged myself back in. Chen B, I suppose a very valid question. Do those blacksmith lapwings struggle to balance with no back toe on windy days? No, Chen B, I don't think they struggle to balance at all. They've adapted to live like that. And their center, gra center of gravity is such that they wouldn't struggle at all. In the same way as a human being, which has no kind of back toe, if you like. I mean, our legs go straight down to the back end of our feet. We don't have struggle balancing too much on a windy day. We're just used to living like that. Ostriches are the same. They, don't, they only have two toes, so they've even lost one of the front toes, and that's because they only run. They don't do any flying whatsoever. So their toes have become a bit like ours. Where the, well, not so much like ours, but we have, we have basically one toe. And that's a huge foot with a couple of appendages sticking on the end of it. The toes themselves play 
yes, they play a big role in balance, but they're not sort of long. Penny, you say that uh, we were chatting about anti-inflammatory trees earlier on. You say that both the marula tree and the common coral tree, Erythrina systemon, have got anti-inflammatory properties. I didn't know about the marula. Thank you very much for that, Penny. Can you tell us which part of the marula? Um, but I d I, the coral tree, of course, we don't get here. So I didn't mention. Well, I didn't. I'm, I didn't mention it, but that's not to say I knew that it had it had uh, anti-inflammatory properties. The other one I wanted to find is called a sneezewood, Tyroxylon obliquum, but they're not that common. And Ellen and Andrea, you say, well, what about Sam's elephant headache remedy? Uh, I am not convinced about Sam's elephant headache remedy. I'm not sure that I would be inhaling the, sm the smoke of elephant dung. Um, but what it probably does is just knock you out. I have heard it many times before, but what it probably does is just knock you out. And then you sleep through your headache and wake up recovered. And here is a pan. That is not a pan. That is a pan. And the pan has got a couple of impala around it. That concrete thing there, everybody, is where they have what we call bush breakfasts or bush suppers from Arethusa. They'll come out here and have bush, uh, dinner in the bush, which is a wonderful experience. To dine under the stars on Michelin quality food. Mmm. Makes me hungry for breakfast, doesn't it, Brian? Even though we did have one delicious Zizifus fruit each. Not quite enough. Impala, like I've said before, highly water dependent and so they will need to come down to these pans almost on a daily basis to have a drink and we were asked during the drought and I mentioned this the other day which animals I thought were going to suffer the most and while the drought was ongoing I thought the warthogs were going to suffer the most you'll read that warthogs suffer desperately from drought and I don't believe that it was the warthogs at all I think it was the impala that started to look the ropiest as well as the buffalo and some of the elephant. And I had a friend who used to have a rule, and his rule was that he had to stop for impalas at least once a day. And he did that because they are just so magnificent, and yet we do tend to drive past them and not give them sufficient respect and attention, I feel. Okay, let's carry on from here. We're going to head down south of Arethusa and then head back to where Karula was and just see if she isn't there with her little ones. See how this male looks very relaxed? He's with a herd of females. He's not chasing them around. Maybe he's just managed to chase off the others. But I think the rut has been severely hampered this year by the drought. And I wonder how many of these females are going to fall pregnant this year. All right, let's go and get an update from Sam. I'll probably see you back on Juma. Sam? Let me just see. Daker. Daker. Oh, well, yes, it's a Daker. We've been looking for a Daker. We finally got on, on live TV. They, oh, that's great. Well done, Viem. Well done, Viem. We sat with about two Dakers over the last two days trying to get a shot of them. Every single time we see them, they get away from us. And VM has finally spotted one. And the trick is to actually not switch off your vehicle when you spot them, because as soon as you switch off the vehicle, they're gone. So that was the common Daker. So we've seen the common Daker and we've seen the Steenbok over the last two days. It's fantastic. They are the smallest of the antelope out here. Someone was asking about that this morning. And those are the smallest. So the common Daker will also be eaten by the leopard and the caracal 
serval, and sometimes by the big lions. Lions are opportunistic animals and do their best to eat whatever they can find out here in the bush. Nate, who is a new viewer, welcome Nate. So you're asking how big will the groups of the kudus get to? Well, Nate, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the harem. So sometimes you can find a number of females that will stick together, and they like to stick together purely because of of safety and numbers. So you'll see a number of females with their youngster together. So get up to 12. I mean, that's the biggest kudu group of kudu that I've seen together is about 12 females and youngsters. But I'm sure they can get a little bit bigger than that. It's amazing when you come across the bush, Nate, and you come across a m big male kudu, and you just see their horns poking out from one of the bushes because they are incredible looking antelope. Where I was in England, I don't know if we have any viewers from England here, but I became in love with the roe deer. I used to get up every morning during my masters, wake up and look for the roe deer and the, the kingfisher that was along the river dart. Every single time I got close to the roe deer, it was gone. But I had very, very good sightings of the owls there and the badgers, and I truly love the English countryside. And I haven't been to America yet, so I'll try and make my way there one day and see all the, the rich vegetation, the predators, the cougars, all the lovely wilderness that exists in America. My, my dream is definitely to go to the northern part of America. After watching Into the Wild, uh, Christa, Christa, I think it's Christopher McCandless or whatever his name was, I just got so inspired to experience the cold, harsh conditions of that area of Alaska. So hopefully I'll get to see some moose and some wolves and wolves. And when we had a conversation a bit earlier about how, so we've got some hyena tracks that have been walking here. So we might just bump into a hyena, but we know that Tungana was on a kill here earlier, well, about three, four days ago. So there could be tracks, those tracks from the hyenas that were circling, looking for the scam, or scavenging from the kill. Ooh, James is with a small raptor. Let's see what it is. This is very exciting, everybody. That is a shukra, if I'm not much mistaken. I'm just going to check quickly. Oh, no. Gone. So a little raptor, a little hawk. Uh, I think I've got it wrong, to be honest. I'm just going to quickly find what it was in my bird app and that was chased off of course by one of those starlings where on earth is it here we go we're into the right section and the things to remember about that bird of course was it was a no it wasn't it was a little sparrow hawk let me show you what was it okay it had yellow eyes it did, didn't it? Yellow eyes, and it had kind of a, kind of a, there. No, well, I don't know. That's the shikra there. I don't think it's the shikra. It's got, that's got red eyes. It did have those very obvious red bars, though. They're sort of rufous-colored bars, but those red eyes are very distinctive on the shikra. So I don't think it was the shikra. Let's um, go along to the little sparrow hawk. What do you think, Brian? Maybe a little sparrow hawk. It, certainly the size was better. Yeah. I think that's probably what it was. The little sparrow hawk. Beautiful, hey? Amazing. And they were so cross, the, the Dorongas and the Starling. And eventually he decided they were shouting at him too much, so he left. He'll eat little birds. And I saw a shot the other day that uh, inevitably... Uh, 
a BBC wildlife photographer had managed to get of a, shik a well, a little sparrowhawk, a British sparrowhawk, taking a, I think it was a blue jay, off a bird table. And <laughs> this bird, I mean, the speed at which it takes a little bird off, off its perch is quite astonishing. It took four and a half seconds from about 100 meters away to go flying along the ground through a garden gate and below the line at which the blue jay could see and then suddenly it rose up in front of the bird table and all there was is a puff of feathers and the blue jay was gone. I've seen one of those also chasing a red-backed shrike, which I told you about the other day. And the shrike only got away by flying up as high as it could go. Because while they have great straight line speed and diving speed, those birds, the raptors, they don't have very good height gaining speed. They don't need that normally. All right, let's head back to Sam. I'm gonna head back towards where Karula was. Sorry, I just needed to drink some water there. <laughs> it's not a very hot day this morning, but you still need to keep your liquids up. Wherever you go looking in the wilderness, take a bottle of water with you, take your binoculars, and you should be fine prerequisite for a walk in the bush. <laughs> Chelsea from Utah. I know I kept saying caracal and honey badger. I know, I know, I know. And you know, it's so difficult to see them. You know, honey badger, of course, we're only going to find in the evening if we're lucky. And caracal is only something I've seen on Table Mountain where I live in Cape Town. So the chances of seeing both are going to be very, very hard, Chelsea. But I'm, myself and Viem and all the other filmers out here at the camp are very keen to see both those animals. And the thing is, to, to see them, you have to be going fairly slowly because they are not going to show themselves to you. A honey badger and a caracal are not going to show themselves to you. You need to look for them. And, and it's, it's all about looking for the change and the movements in the grass. The caracal's ear flick. Little movements, subtle movements like that will give their, their presence away. So it takes a lot of listening, a lot of attention to the bush to be able to see those. But Chelsea, I'm going to do my very best to tell you that. Shall do. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen from North Dakota is saying, Sam, I'm not sure that you would be able to survive in the north there. You would have to put on a little bit of weight um, and get some nice warm jocks and all the things that you need to be part of that cold environment. Ellen, I'll do my, you know, if, I, if it was to get to the point where I could go and experience that wilderness, I would prepare myself as much as I need to. You will have a look at this tree that's been, you can really significantly see the bark that's been ripped off the side of it. This is the power of the elephants. The elephants will rip parts of the tree. If, if you're a new viewer and you haven't seen this, have a look at the power of an elephant that can rip the bark to get to the cambium layer. The cambium layer provides the rich nutrients for the elephant, so they like that. And it's not so nice for the trees because, of course, they become ring barked and die. But at the moment, this tree will be fine because it's only been ring barked to, to halfway, so it should be fine for now. But if another Ellie was to come and strip the other side of that bark, that tree might be seeing better days. But Ellen, if I get the opportunity to go to, that, to the northern parts of America, 
I will most definitely, you know, carry carry heavy carry heavy things that will will give me the duty to go through. You know, when I went to the Amazon last year, it was very very hot, very very hot conditions. I've never ever experienced such a thing. I went down. Um, it's like being in the Congo. It's the same like latitude. It's very very hot. So I got there and I had to canoe down the river for a week, and I never put sun cream on my legs. And I was canoeing down the river, and I got to the end of the day, and my legs were completely sunburnt. It was terrible. And I had to sleep on the, on the banks, on the sand. So it was just rubbing in, and the mosquitoes on the Amazon are huge, probably around that big. And so I was experiencing big mosquitoes. I had a massive sunburn, but it was incredible. The opportunity is to see a pink dolphin, to see jaguar, to see a smaller jaguar, and I, I can't remember the name, I think it was a jaguaricha. Beautiful, beautiful, like, I need another word other than beautiful to explain that, that animal. Very, very lucky to have had the privilege of seeing. Myself and James this week will be out every single drive, so morning, afternoon, the whole week. Steph might come in for one or two drives, but otherwise, we are going to keep our eyes out for any animals that we don't normally see. Yeah. Yeah. Go back. I saw a track there. Looks like a bit of fauna. CJ the Rocker, I'm going to answer your question on meerkats now, but Vim has seen something, so we're just going to reverse and get eyes on what he's seen. Have you found some tracks? Okay, just show it. You can't see it now. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just drive slowly on this road and see if you can pick up those tracks again. So we, we might have found tracks of a leopard. We are close to Philemon, Philemon's dip, which is where like about 100 meters from where the cubs were seen. So there's every chance that it could be Karula's tracks that have been moving around in this direction. James is following up in that area over there at the moment, so he'll be looking there. We'll drive down here to see if we can locate on any tracks that might have gone towards quarantine. But the question that we had on meerkats no, I, we don't get meerkats here um, in the savannah. It's, it's normally in the Karoo. So that was from CJ the Rocker. We don't get meerkats here. It's normally in the drier desert areas. Look, there's another kudu. Just ahead of us, there's a kudu. So if Karula was here, this antelope would most certainly not be here. But we had a question earlier around social groups of kudu, and this from a distance seems to be, can you, I think it's a female, but it might have some small horns, yes, it's a female, so there might be a few others as we move a little closer to this kudu. Is it a female? I'm seeing horns. No, it's a young male. Amazing, a young male. So this kudu, young kudu male is going to grow to be to grow those long, long horns. He's still, oh, there's another one. So we've seen two now. And this seems to be a female. There's three, there's four. One, two, three, four, kudu. Look how young, oh, we've been lucky to see the young kudus this, this morning. We saw one to the north of our property and now we're seeing two over here. Have a look at that youngster. There's some, it looks like there's something dripping from her eye line. I wonder what that is. I can't, I can't get a good visual of that. But maybe she got a thorn to the eye that made her tear up, a little dark patch beneath her eye. 
Sam, they probably learn quite quickly when they eat those acacia thorns, how sharp those thorns can really be. But I can just see four of them now. They're all browsing on this tree here. Marcel is saying the kudus look nice, fluffy, and good to pat. I guess they do, Marcel, but patting them, I don't think they would like. They would probably buck me in the face if I got anywhere close to doing something like that. Or they would just run away. So they're quite comfortable in the presence of a vehicle. Look at, at feeding. That's the... This is the great thing about being able to go out in a vehicle is that you're able to get around animals and allow them to be relaxed and watch them feeding as we can see right now. You can see an oxpecker right by the ear of this kudu and this oxpecker, which is the red-billed oxpecker, will be you <laughs> trying to get all the ticks right by its ear there. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be, well it seems to be annoying I could do quite, quite a lot. I don't think he's going to fall off this oxpecker. He's got too much strength in those legs. But the kudu's ear is giving him a good fight, saying, listen, get off. <laughs> What's interesting between the yellow-billed oxpecker and the red-billed is that I think it is the red build that picks, that scissors through. So they scissor, scissor through and try and collect the ticks, whereas the yellow build will just pick the ticks out. So they have two different techniques in the way in which they collect the ticks off the animals. So he's now, the oxbeck is now pestering the other side of the ear. It must be quite annoying having birds coming in. I mean, it's, it's grooming them and helping them protect them from all the diseases that might be out here. So oxpeckers are crucial to this environment. But it must be annoying to have something flicking through your ear half the time. But something that I learned just the other day was the way in which even a tick is important for an environment, to the ecology of an environment. Everything ha has its role to play out here and has a purpose. And when you think about the tick, all you think about is a parasite. But a lot of the time, we don't, we don't see the tick as something that contributes to the ecosystem. And why, what I mean by that is when ticks are on, on different mammals, such as elephants and, and hippos and all the others, big, big ones, the buffaloes, they will move towards watering holes to try and get those ticks off them. Um, by throwing mud on themselves and rubbing themselves against trees and having that parasite allows for water and bigger, bigger watering holes to open up because of the animals trying to get rid of the ticks. So that then contributes to more water filling up into those basins. And what will that do? That will create more life for biodynamics. So from um, butterflies to bees, to, to antelope that can feed, on, feed and drink on the water, creating a much greater availability of food source and water source, which can be all linked back to the, tink, uh, to the tick that is irritating the larger mammals on the property. So it's all really interesting when you take down and start to look at the relationship between parasites to big mammals. Chelsea in Utah is commenting that, that the kudu is her favorite animal. Yes, Chelsea, they're definitely one of mine as well. They are very majestic, as you said, and they just have that humbleness. That's the one thing that I really like about a kudu is that they, they get this feeling of humbleness, very relaxed, calm, collected. And have a look at those, those horns that are just coming out of this young male. 
can't be more. It's just over a year, year and a half. And look at him feeding. So he's feeding on, on a thorny tree there. They'll be very, very specific about some of the things that they'll eat. So, sometimes you'll find um, kudus and other such animals going towards timburti thickets and eating some of the timburtis there. And that has like a, they wouldn't want to, but they'll go there to try and um, help their stomachs when, when their stomachs are bad. It will make their, their well, diarrhea is the best word that I can describe that a tamburti tree will do for them. It's almost like a medicinal tree for them, much like the Balanites tree is to the elephant that likes to eat the seed pod, the Balanites, that helps with their digestion. So there's intelligence with all, within all these different creatures and how they use, you all utilize different things in the bush to help them with their survival out here. Another incredible thing that I read about kudu is the way in which they can run and jump. They can really, when they're getting chased by a predator, they have such a big jump and leap, which hopefully I'll get to see in the future. But this is a great shot. Look at the two youngsters that are just following the mother. Very cool to watch that. You can very significantly see those white stripes that are on the side of these kudus. Megan in Ottawa is asking, could those two youngsters over there be twins? Megan, we've had this question before, and that was with giraffes. Sometimes we'll find giraffes that are, that'll have twins. But it's more, it's more likely here in this situation that there has been two females and the females, you know, they'll look after the other calf sometimes. So they'll join groups and the, the youngsters will like to follow each other, follow the mother into the thickets that they go in. So I don't think that they are twins. I think that they are two separate calves from two separate mothers. But we never know. I mean, I don't... I don't know for sure if that's definitely not a twin. But it's a good it's a good query. But we've had such a fascinating sighting here of the two young kudus and talking about the kudu and the social groups here. Let's go and see how James is doing with the warthogs. There is a lone, forlorn piglet, everybody, a Monday morning piglet, drinking from this uh, cesspit, cesspool. Not very clean water here at Treehouse Lake. But that's absolutely fine for all the animals, especially a little piggy. Oh, jeepers, Brian, you see in the, underneath him there? He's got some kind of severe injury. Let's just wait for him to turn around. Ooh, he's now standing on it. He's obviously in some discomfort. I don't know what's had a go at him, but it would explain why he's alone. Maybe the entire sounder that he was part of, or she is part of, was attacked. Oh, Shane, this little thing's not in a good way. Just having a drink now. I don't want to try and get any closer and give it a fright. Let's just wait and see if it turns around. If it doesn't, we'll go around the other side. That looks like a piece of skin to me that's hanging off. And quite possibly a predator got hold of this little thing. Here we go. Oh, eesh, look at that. That's not skin, is it, Brian? I mean, what is that? You think it's intestines? Oof. That is horrendous. No, that's...
that's that's not an intestine. I don't. It definitely is inside, so it's not a flap of skin. Goodness, I wonder which piece of that poor thing that is. Now, of course, it is at times like these that we get the inevitable questions about would we ever help that thing, and the answer, unfortunately, is no. It's not unfortunate. I mean, this is just the way that nature happens. And so we try and let it just take its course, but it just doesn't make it any easier to see a very obviously suffering animal like this. I have no idea what part of the pig that is. I don't think it's an intestine because it's got that large flappy bit at the end. And I also don't think that she'd be drinking if the stomach had been kind of semi-removed. Oh, shame. But, you know, while this does look horrid, the warthog is still in very good condition. It does look quite weak and sad, and I'm sure the thirst has got to do with the fact that it is injured. I mean, I know that even human beings become thirsty if they are injured. But it is remarkable out here what animals are able to recover from. So maybe this little warthog will get through this. Or maybe it will eventually feed Karula's little babies, because we're not too far from there. And I've no doubt a predator will pick up on it within the next 12 hours or so. And if it isn't recovering, they would indeed put it out of its misery. Now again, I mean, a lot of people are saying, you know, we'd love it to be put out of its misery. We don't know what its misery is, and we've got to be clear on that, everybody. We so often out here intervene and we make a mess. This warthog, yeah, I know you won't believe it, but it could survive this. It might just manage to survive it. And so for us to come and intervene and destroy the warthog in an effort to put it out of its pain might actually be doing it a great disservice. So we're definitely not going to do that. We're going to let nature take its course and see what happens. Now, tilt down, man. You reckon that that might be a tusk fight? Tilt down, man. I would say I agree, would agree with you if that was an adult male, because the males do fight with each other viciously. I just don't think that it can be with a young sow like that. I mean, that's a female, unless you know. I don't know what she would have done to have irritated a a, a big boar that he would have done that to her. But looking at the wound, it's quite possible that it, it, was a, it was a tusk that penetrated there. Well, that's interesting. Megan, you say, could that possibly be the uterus? Yes, I think it possibly could, Megan. It could well be the uterus. That's a very interesting thought. Ugh, can you imagine the pain? Well, Karula's not far from here. We did go and have a look there to see if her youngsters were still there, and they weren't. But maybe she is around here thinking of a Monday evening pork roast. And Catherine, you say you couldn't do this job because of you'd see an animal like this and want to help it or put it out of its misery. We do, you know, we have exactly the same instincts. Um, but when we sign up to do this, we accept that by and large, unless there's an anthropogenic effect, in other words, unless that injury was caused by a human being, we are not going to do anything. 
and it is hard. And Frank, you're watching on YouTube and you say you confirm that wounds like this do cause, th uh, do cause a great thirst in animals. I mean, the other thing, and I, I, I mean, I obviously don't know this for sure, but it could be self-inflicted. It's possible that maybe if that is the uterus, that she had an extremely painful pregnancy, and we know that animals, if they are in experience internal pain, will often try and rip that pain out of them. And it's possible that that is a self-inflicted wound, because if it is the bottom tusks, she has got very sharp bottom tusks, she could easily have ripped that out of herself. This really is horrible. And freedom believer, you're absolutely right. If she's in shock, then, you know, she won't be feeling anything like the pain that we think she is. Freedom believer, I don't think she's in shock anymore. I think she's beyond that. I think if she was in shock, she wouldn't necessarily be coming down to the water to drink, making that conscious decision to lessen her pain by having some water. I have, I have no doubt that's very painful indeed. Anyway... I don't think that we should stick around here any much any longer. Let's leave her be. And we'll come back here during the afternoon and see if she's still here. Mm. Yes. Now I agree with Chelsea's sentiments from Utah. Chelsea, you say you hope that Karula does come down here and puts that warthog out of it, her misery and feeds the cubs, and that would be a rather good end to the story. May well happen. She's not far from here. And we were talking about animals that pick up on injuries and uh, uh, potential, potential prey and how prey animals, when they are injured, are immediate targets for predators. Karula would pick up pick that up in a second if she came down here and saw that i think she might attack openly i don't you know she may not even bother to stalk and just to keep you posted on the four birmingham males the remaining four of the gang they are now on and coral they killed a buffalo last night and so they are feeding happily their brother taxon went to look at he has confirmed that it is one of them. I'm sure it's Scrapper, as we suspected. The Sabi Sands has not removed him yet, so I'm not sure if they're going to. Maybe this time they won't. But he apparently is beginning to smell rather offensive, which means that he has been dead for longer than just a day. Watch out there, Brian. He must have been dead for at least 48 hours by now if he started to smell. And Elaine, yes, your question is a, is a good one and it is entirely possible. You say, could the Birmingham boys have attacked one of their own? Yes, it's possible. It's unlikely, but it is possible. Certainly they have fought a lot amongst themselves, those Birmingham boys. And I think it's quite possible that they could have sort of attacked each other. Maybe at a kill site, maybe things escalated. We know that they're a particularly violent bunch. They've killed many females while they've you know, during the course of their takeover. So it is possible, yes. I think it's unlikely, though. I think it's more likely that he got sick. Uh, he, did, he did seem to be the one that was sort of, I think it was Scrapper, who was skinny, and a lot of you thought he'd been bitten by a snake. I don't think it was a snake. It may well have been bovine tuberculosis, uh, but I don't see how the others wouldn't have been affected in the same way if he has. So I don't know. I hope they do an autopsy, but I think it's probably got a bit late by now, you know, if he's already starting to rot.
Oh, and Romeo, uh, Romeo, absolutely. You're in Ohio. You say, is it possible that he he would have, uh, you know, the others knew he was sick and left him behind? Um, I don't think they would have left him behind because he was sick. But if he had been slow, slightly, and didn't couldn't keep up with the other four, absolutely, they'd dump him and leave him. There was no honour amongst the lions. They will leave each other to their own fate. As soon as anyone's injured, that's it. Sorry, buddy. Good luck. Keep up and you can scavenge or what we kill, but otherwise you're on your own. And so while I don't know that they would have necessarily picked up on an illness that he had and left him because of that, I definitely think they could easily have left him because he was slowing them down slightly. But he was on his own a lot anyway. You know, before, long before he died, he used to spend most of his time on his own. It was very seldom that we saw all five of them together and was much more often four and one. So I think he was maybe a bit older than them. I don't know. He, he certainly wasn't much bigger than them, so I don't know that he was that much older. Very strange. And I'm sad that he, if he is, I mean, yeah, if he's starting to rot now, they won't, an autopsy will be almost entirely, entirely um, superfluous. All right, let's head across to Sam and get an update from him. So the day is beginning to warm up slightly, even though just above us you can still see some clouds that are present that might just bring us a little bit of rain. If it is some rain, it'll be a few drops, nothing significant. So we will most definitely be here for the afternoon drive. I tell you, I've thoroughly enjoyed this drive from tracking that leopard this morning to sitting with some kudu and talking about all the relevant things and biomimicry, conservation and all the things that I enjoy and would love to share and talk about more. I really, really would like to say that to everyone that, you know, talking about the way in which we are in, in conservation, where we are at the moment and what conservationists in our past that have really, really influenced our way of thinking and our way of seeing and how we might be able to grow into a future that is more non-human centered so that we can live in the natural biodiversity and have it all thrive around us. With that, we've had such a good time. Vian, thanks for being on the vehicle. You had such good camera work on that day cage. You know, it was amazing. He managed to catch it and watch it run through the thickets. It was incredible. James, James and I are going to be on every single day this week, so I'm excited to go out there with Mr. Baggins and see what we can go and learn out here in the bush. Otherwise, have a fantastic evening, day, whatever you're going to do, and we will see you for the sunset safari this evening. So just before we finish our drive, a very quiet drive after the immense action of yesterday evening, but that's just how it goes out here, and sometimes it's pleasant to have a gentle and relaxing stroll about the place. Um, we are going to be changing times as we head towards our winter, and our days get shorter. And on the 1st of May, the times will change, not the morning drive. The morning drive will remain the same, but the afternoon drive will shift to half an hour earlier. So from half past three Central African time, we will be shifting to three o'clock Central African time. And on the east coast of the States, that will be 9 a.m. for you. And on the west coast of the States, it will be 6 a.m. So all you have to remember, basically, is that it's 30 minutes earlier than it is now. And it will then close 30 minutes earlier as well. So that will be from the 1st of May. But the mornings will stay precisely as they are probably for the next two or three weeks and then we too will shift them a little bit later as it gets too dark. It's almost on that fringe at the moment, you know, you go out in the morning and we still need to use, a, we do need to use a spotlight when we go out to start and the danger is of course that you drive over tracks and so as soon as it gets too dark for that we will shift over to an earlier, at least a later morning drive. Alrighty, let us drive around quarantine clearings and see if anything is here. And Donna, while we drive around here, I was wondering exactly the same thing yesterday as we were driving through Cheetah Plains. Have there been any sightings of the Styx cubs yet? Donna, no, I don't think there have been. Uh, well, no, I mean, I know somebody's seen them. 
but I don't know, they certainly are not with the pride yet. Remember, they'll only start moving with the pride after about six weeks or so. And so I think they have been seen, but there have been no consistent sightings yet. Now, I've no doubt at some stage they're going to come on to the southern reaches of their, northern reaches of their territory, the southern reaches of sort of Treehouse Dam there, basically, is where the northern part of their territory ends. So I've no doubt they will come back there at some stage. That was the last time I saw the last little cubs that they had before they were mercilessly taken from this world by the Birmingham boys. And Blair, in British Columbia, you are wondering about when, if and when the Nkuhuma Pride gives birth, will we sort of restrict the sightings like we have with the leopards? I'm just watching two impala there. It's very it's a bit thick. I just I don't know. Just, uh, they were running through the running through that area there. They seem to have gone down towards the west. We'll just have a quick look there, Blair. There won't be quite the same restrictions, um, mainly because when a lioness starts to move with her cubs, you know she'll have them out in the open, and they will have the protection of the pride. That will be at six weeks. Until then, she will keep them in a den. And if we were to come across the den by accident and she was moving the den, for example, or carrying the cubs about, we'd probably hang around and have a quick look and then we'd leave them again. They're not nearly as sensitive, of course, as the leopards are. And that's simply because they are much larger. They are the dominant predator of the area. Those yellow flowers you saw as Brian was filming that impala of the flowers of Senna Paticiana. And they seem to be flowering beautifully now. Brian, there's also a really nice monarch butterfly with his wings folded here, just in front. Can you see him? Check this out, everybody. Watch this punch zoom. Papao. <laughs> Very nice. Look at that. Look at that. That is the monarch butterfly, and I know you, many of you in the States will know exactly what that is. That is an African monarch butterfly, not, a, not an American one. But he's there. There he is, bottom, bottom of the screen there. Look at the black and white. It's even more impressive than the orange. There he is again. Now remember, he's coloured like that because he is poisonous, toxic to potential predators. And that orange, black and white, like it is on so many animals, is a warning coloration. Drinking away at the bit of the nectar inside there. Oh, I actually saw him there when I put my cap on. Where would you like me to turn my head, Brian? My left. Can you see him? He was actually sitting there when I took him out of my box. And I was surprised. I thought he'd just fly off in the wind, but he's managed to survive. And I move forward. How's that? Can you see him now? Do you want me to take my hat off? Okay, if you, if you move, the, move the camera slightly, I'll, I'll, I'll move. <laughs> there he is, everybody. A little praying mantis. <laughs> right, everybody, that's going to be it from us. Thank you very much for the drive. As we say goodbye to my new friend who likes to live on my hat. Brian, thank you for your efforts thank today. You. It is starting to warm up. Thank you to all of you for your questions and comments during the quiet drives. That's the best kind of comments that we have from you on these quiet drives. A big thanks, of course, to Louise and Kirsten in the final control and, of course, to Samwise, Gam, G, and Viam on the other vehicle. We'll see you later today at half past three for the school drive, I think. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye.